Um, today I'm going to finish off with uh, homogeneous deformations, but we've got a few things to complete before we get to that. So in yesterday's lecture, we wrote the real space vector A1 is equal to something times A1 star plus A2 star plus G13 times A3 star. So we simply expressed the basis vector in real space in terms of the uh, basis vectors of the reciprocal space. Okay. Now, how do I get the value of G1? Can you remember? G11, the component. Yeah. Yeah. So if I take a dot product with A1, then we get G11 is equal to A1 dot A1, right? A1 star, sorry. Yeah, and, and so on. So in that way, we are able to derive all these uh, components. And so we have a relationship between real space and reciprocal space. And the components are simply given by taking successive dot products with A1, with A2, and with uh, A3. Yep, everyone happy with that? Now, once we do that, we can write these relations for all three basis vectors and obtain something which is known as the metric tensor. Okay, so this tensor allows you to transform the components of a vector in real space into reciprocal space, or if you take the inverse of this, the other way around. Okay. So this, uh, this is a completely general matrix, and by taking these dot products, you can derive, uh, derive this matrix, which allows you to transform the components in real space, that means a direction, into a plane normal which is parallel to that direction. Okay, is everyone happy with that? So, if I do this for all the seven different crystal systems. Well, let's start with the orthorhombic system. Um, the products A1 dot A1 are very easy. It's uh, just A squared, B squared, and C squared because all the axes are at 90 degrees to each other. And this is your metric tensor. So if I have a, a direction 1, 1, then it will change into a plane normal, which is A squared, B squared. Yeah. If I multiply this by the direction 1, 1, then the plane normal parallel to this direction will be A squared, B squared, 0. Okay. So 1, 1, 0 direction will be parallel to the normal to the plane A squared, B squared, 0. Okay. In other words, the plane that we are referring to is this plane here. This is the direction 1, 1, and the normal to that plane, uh, the uh, plane normal to that direction is this uh, plane, okay? It's, it's not this one, this is the 1, 1 plane. If I wanted to see which direction is normal to the 1, 1 plane, what would I do? Yeah. Um, Here's our inverse, inverse, no, not reciprocal, yeah? So this is the inverse matrix here. I multiply this by 1, 1, and I will get the direction as A to the minus 2, B to the minus 2, 0. You can clearly see that the normal to this 1, 1 plane is not par uh, parallel to the 1, 1 direction. Okay. So that's for the orthorhombic system. And we can derive this matrix for all seven um, crystal classes. So you can see for cubic, it's obviously A squared, A squared, A squared, because you know the 1, 1 direction is parallel to the 1, 1 plane normal, right? Then we have the tetragonal system. So the A squared has changed to C squared. Orthorhombic system, where we have A squared, B squared, C squared. Gets more complicated. This this we partially derived yesterday. Do you remember? Where we had the A squared and the half A squared and so forth. So this is uh, the metric tensor for the hexagonal system. 
more complicated for the trigonal system where A equals B equals C and all the angles are equal but less than 90. Okay, so this is the trigonal system. Uh, we have the monoclinic system and the worst of all, which is triclinic. So now, you know, given these matrices, uh, you don't need to do all those dot products and so forth. You want to convert a direction into a plane normal, you just use this matrix. Okay? Or, or the other way around. Is everybody happy with that? So for any crystal system now, you can find a direction which is parallel to a plane normal or, or a plane normal which is parallel to a direction. Okay? Right, if I just go back one slide. This is a, a little calculation for cementite. You know, you will have seen equations in textbooks which tell you the angles between plane normals and directions. And here's a very easy way of deriving these equations. You don't actually need to use those equations anymore because you've got the metric tensors. But supposing I have a plane normal which, uh, which has uh, the indices are H1, H2, and H3. Okay, so this is a plane normal, H. And I want to find its magnitude. Then in the last lecture, we learned that to find the magnitude, we take h dot h, which means multiply by its components in reciprocal space, which is h1, h2, h3, times its components in real space. Right? And the components in real space we can uh, obtain by taking this and multiplying by the matrix ten metric tensor. So this is exactly the same as this. Yeah, correct? So then it becomes very easy. It's uh, uh, I go back to my uh, orthorhombic metric here. If I multiply this by h1, h2, h3, then I get uh, h1 over a1 squared, h2 over b2 squared, and so forth. Yeah. So here is the magnitude of our vector h1, h2, h3, which is a plane normal, is h1 squared over a1 squared, blah, blah. Yep. Magnitude squared, by the way. So do you, do you remember uh, you were asking me the question yesterday that, you know, it seems strange, but magnitude in reciprocal space should be 1 upon a length, right? So if I take the square root of this, it'll be 1 upon length. Yeah? Uh, okay. So we do the same thing now for the vector u, which is a direction, u1, u2, u3, yeah? and we write uh, u squared, magnitude of u squared is u dot u, which is its components in real space times its components in reciprocal space, and we just obtain, uh, we obtain this by doing that. This is the inverse of this matrix here, so theta star g theta into theta u and we obtain the magnitude as you might expect from Pythagoras, right? Because this is an orthogonal system. So we've got the magnitude of u. Notice that in all of these equations, you know, you will get uh, theta next to theta and so forth, all right? Okay, so we've got the magnitude of u, uh, u and magnitude of h. If I now take h dot u, where these are the components in reciprocal space, which is h1, h2, and h3, and u1, u2, u3, then that's my dot product. If I divide by the magnitudes of h and u, then I get the cos of the angle between the two vectors, because the dot product is magnitude of h times magnitude of u times the cos of the angle, right? So here's, here's the dot product divided by the magnitude, and that's cos, cos phi. So there are textbooks with lists and lists of these equations for different crystal systems. And here is an extremely easy way of deriving those, given the metric tensor. OK? So I think in the first question sheet, where you worked out the angles and so forth in tetragonal systems, it would be much easier to do it with the metric tensor. Is everybody happy with that? And notice also that the tensor is symmetrical. Okay. So if I, if I uh, show you the list again. 
Um, well, it's, it's uh, symmetrical when the symmetry demands it, okay? For the triclinic crystal, it isn't. Uh, well, even for triclinic, yeah, sorry, it is. There you go. Okay? So it's, it's symmetrical, always. Okay, so that completes now uh, the conversion between reciprocal space and real space. You can do anything now with any crystal system. Yeah? So that's quite an achievement. Okay? Now, also in the last lecture, we derived the orientation relationship between these two bases as a coordinate transformation matrix by writing the basis vectors of A in terms of the basis B. Right? It's very, very easy to do because this equation could be derived just by inspection. Right? But when you do an experiment, it's not likely that you get an electron diffraction pattern which conveniently gives you the basis vectors of the ferrite and the basis vectors of the austenite on the same pattern. Right? It's very, very unlikely that you get a pattern which will show you exactly the relationship between the basis vectors. Uh, more, more generally, you know, you'll get something like this. Yeah, everybody heard of the kojimo sachs orientation relationship? Yeah, so this is a very famous uh, uh, measurement of the orientation between austenite and ferrite, where the closed packed planes, or the most closely packed planes from the austenite and the ferrite are parallel, and the closed packed directions within those planes are parallel. So here, for example, is the closed packed plane of austenite is parallel to uh, the most closely packed plane of ferrite. Ferrite doesn't actually have any closed packed planes, but 011 is the most closely packed plane. And this direction which lies in this plane is a closed packed direction which is parallel to a closed packed direction in this plane. The third one is really, um, you know, not independent because if I take the cross product of these two, I will get this. And I take a cross product of these two, I'll get this. Okay? So when, when I take an electron diffraction pattern, you know, it looks something like this, that the 111 austenite is parallel to 110 austenite, and there's, there's another couple of uh, axes parallel. I, I can't derive, by looking at that diffraction pattern, I can't derive a coordinate transformation matrix, right? Yeah, the, the, the previous example that I gave you was too simple. So how do we do this when, when we when we observe that certain directions from the two crystals are parallel, how do we derive the coordinate transformation matrix? Well, the first thing to note is that these are not equalities. Yeah? This says that 111 gamma is parallel to 011 alpha. It doesn't, uh, doesn't say that these are equal. So we need to make them equal. And to do that, we simply divide by the ratio of the magnitudes of these two vectors. If I can make them equal, then I've got an equation. So I'm going to uh, do a complicated example where we have, uh, uh, let me just switch the light, dim the light. Yeah, a complicated example where I have an austenite grain here, okay? And I have two ferrite grains within the same austenite grain. Both of them are kojimo sachs orientations, but look, they are different variants. Yeah. Here, 11 bar 1 gamma is parallel to 011 alpha, whereas here, 111 gamma is parallel to 011 alpha. So these are both in kojimo sachs orientation with the austenite, but they are different crystallographic variants. Yeah. When I say a variant, I mean they are crystallographically equivalent, but the indices are different. OK? Is everybody happy with that? So here you can see there's a difference in the sign for that. And similarly, this is 101, whereas this is bar 101. OK? Right, so first of all, I want to derive the coordinate transformation matrix for this particular ferrite grain and this. And then, uh, using uh, exactly the same procedure, we'll do it for this. And then we want to find the relationship between the two ferrite grains. Okay? So, you know, I want to know what is the relative orientation of the two ferrite grains, because I want to know whether, when a crack passes through the system, is it going to be deflected sufficiently to give me lots of toughness. That's just one example of 
how useful this can be. I don't know if Min Sung is here. Is Min Sung? Yep. So he's doing that kind of work where he's looking at the deflection of cracks as a function of the texture of the ferrite. So first of all, I'll convert these parallelisms into equalities. Right? So again, repeating that orientation relationship, the magnitude of the 111 vector is simply root 3 into the lattice parameter, right? And the magnitude of the 011 vector is simply root 2 into the lattice parameter of ferrite. So I define a, a constant k, which is the magnitude of 111 divided by the magnitude of 110. So when I multiply this k by 0, 0,11 1 alpha, the magnitude of 0 k k alpha becomes exactly equal to that of 1, 1, 1 gamma. Yeah? So this is the ratio of the magnitude of 1, 1, 1 to 0, 1, 1. If I multiply this by this, I get 0 k k, which is exactly parallel to 0, 1, 1, but its magnitude is the same as that of the 1, 1, 1 vector in austenite. Yeah? Is everybody happy with that? Okay. So what we've done is we've converted this into an equality. And I can do that for the other pairs as well. Here I've got the magnitude of the 110 austenite divided by the magnitude of the 111 of ferrite, in other words this. And here I've got the magnitude of 121 austenite divided by the magnitude of 211 ferrite. Okay? So by using these constants, I can write these relations as equalities instead of parallelisms. Okay. So we end up with three equations now. That 0 kk alpha will be equal to this coordinate transformation matrix which relates the ferrite to the austenite multiplied by the uh, 111 in austenite. Is everyone happy with that? So by converting these things into equalities, I can relate the two, okay? Uh, using a coordinate transformation matrix which we don't know at the moment. Yeah, but it exists. Okay, everyone clear about that? Okay, so now I'm going to express these as, uh, so these are three equations, and I'm going to write them as a single equation in matrix form. Okay, so I'll, I'll collect all these vectors into matrices. It's exactly the same information. So here uh, I've got 0, k, k, which is this column vector, bar g, bar g, and g, and 2m, bar m, m. This is our coordinate transformation matrix, and here we also have these column vectors here. So if I multiply this column by this, okay, then I get this number. If I multiply uh, this uh, row by this column, I get this number. If I multiply this by this, I get this number. And that gives me the first equation. Okay? So this is simply the same information expressed in terms of matrices. Yeah? So can anyone tell me now how I can get this? We've got this as unknown. How can I get that? Both sides, yeah. So, so can you can you tell me exactly? Yeah, you are you are quite right. Where where do I do the multiplication? The right side of the both right hmm. of the matrix for the ratio and right side of the both. yeah. Because, you know, in doing matrix multiplications, you've got to be careful about the order in which you do it. So if I, if I multiply this side by the inverse of this, yeah, on this side, then I've got to multiply this side by the inverse here, okay, not over here. So when I do that, this will disappear, becomes an identity matrix. That means this is 1, 1, 1, and everything is 0 and I get my coordinate transformation matrix. Is everybody happy with that? Yeah. So in, in, in shorter form, 
if I, if I call this matrix A and this matrix B, then we've got A <coughs> equals J into B, right? So if I multiply by B to the minus 1 over here, then I get A into B to the minus 1 equals J, right? So from our electron diffraction pattern, in which you have two sets of parallel vectors, the third one follows automatically, yeah? we can derive the complete coordinate transformation matrix, which is far better than working it all out on a stereogram, because you can just substitute numbers into it. Okay? You might want to still draw a stereogram to visualize things, to see which directions and which plane normals are parallel. But once you have this matrix, you've got all the information you need about the orientation relationship, and you can find out which direction from austenite, whether it's 1, 3, 5, or, or whatever, is parallel to what direction in ferrite, and, and vice versa. So when I do this multiplication, I get a matrix which looks like this for the orientation relationship between the grain X and the gamma. And the way that I've written this is I've taken the ratio A gamma over A alpha outside of the matrix so that all these rows here are unit vectors. Yeah, so if I take the square of this, square of this, and square of this, and add them up, I will get 1. And similarly, this is also 1. Now, you don't need to do that, right? But it's, it's nicer in appearance. Don't you think? OK. <laughs> Professor Sazaki told me that I don't make any jokes in the lecture. So this is the only joke that I've been able to find. OK? Right. If you take the determinant of this whole matrix, then that will give you the ratio of the volumes of the two unit cells of austenite and ferrite. OK? So if you take the determinant of this whole matrix, that will give you the ratio of the volumes of the unit cell. But if you take a determinant of just these numbers, then it will be 1, yeah? Because all the vectors in there are unit vectors, OK? So this is the complete definition of the kerjimov sachs orientation relationship between ferrite and austenite. OK, so that's quite a powerful result, because you've come across this orientation relationship many, many times, OK? Now, of course, uh, we can do exactly the same for y and for gamma. And this is another variant of that orientation relationship. And notice that the numbers are exactly the same, but they are in different order or different signs. Right? So when these two variants are crystallographically equivalent, the numbers inside the matrix must be exactly identical but arranged in a different order according to some symmetry operation. OK? Right, so we've got two matrices. We've got xj gamma and yj gamma. How can I find xjy? OK, so now I want to find the orientation relationship between the two grains of ferrite. want is a matrix X, J, Y. Now remember that with this uh, notation, in your equation, like bases must be next to each other. OK? So, it should be very easy for you to spot how to get x, j, y. OK, so we have x, j, gamma times gamma, j, y. Yeah. And notice that like basis symbols are next to each other. And where do I get gamma, j, y from? Yeah. 
Yeah, but that's why, J Gamma. Inverse. Strictly speaking, inverse. Okay? Uh, in general. So if I take the inverse of that, I've got this, and I've got the orientation relationship between the two grains of ferrite. Okay? Now, I pointed out to you that these are crystallographic variants. All right? The two ferrite grains. Uh, the numbers in here are identical. They're simply arranged in a different manner. So the two ferrite grains should really be related by a, a simple... Yeah, so that's the equation. Um, let me just... OK, I'll come back to the two ferrite grains, all right? Let me first do the, now the orientation relationship between um, cementite and ferrite. So this is known as the Bagariatsky orientation relationship. Yeah. Again, uh, very commonly observed. And you get an electron diffraction pattern like this. The cementite reflections are weak if you have small volume fraction of cementite, OK? Right, uh, so the 100 of cementite is parallel to 0 bar 11 one of ferrite, and 010 zero zero cementite parallel to 111 of ferrite. And this time, this is an orthorhombic unit cell, OK? And this is, of course, uh, cubic. So we do exactly the same as we did for kojimov sachs First of all, we convert this into equalities instead of parallelisms. So even though we have the basis vectors of theta here, we don't have the basis vectors of ferrite. So we've got to go through the procedure we used previously. So we find these constants, uh, k, g, and m, which will make these into equalities. Okay. So here we have the magnitude of the 100 theta divided by the 011 alpha. And you multiply that by the 011 alpha, and you will get this to be equal in length to this. OK, so it's straightforward then. 0kk alpha is an unknown times this. That unknown times this. Rearrange that into a matrix equation, and you've got your answer. Now, in this case, you see, because we've got 100, theta, 010, and 001, this simply is an identity matrix. So this is now our Bagajaski orientation relationship. Yeah? And you can work out you know, which plane of cementite is parallel to what plane of ferrite, and so forth. And if you want, you can use the matrix to plot the stereogram. Yeah? Stereogram of the orientation relationship. So is everybody happy about this? Yeah, it, it's a very powerful method of interpreting your diffraction data or for looking at which directions give good fit between the two lattices and so forth. Yeah. OK, so that's our, our matrix. Uh, I, I haven't taken any factors out common because remember, we've got three different lattice parameters here. So, so you can see that these are not of magnitude 1 each. And the determinant of this matrix will give you the ratio of the unit cell of cementite to that of ferrite. OK? Right, so going back to our two crystals of uh, ferrite inside the same grain of austenite. Uh, I've worked out the matrix yjx, and I get it to look something like this. So this actually happens to be a, a twin orientation. So one ferrite grain is related to the other by a twin. Does everybody understand what a twin is? Yeah. OK, so just, just to show you uh, very quickly, if I take uh, a plane between the two crystals, uh, an appropriate plane, then I can generate one by reflection across the other. Okay, so that's that's called a twin, and this plane typically is is a one 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 plane or a one one two plane. So if I reflect about that plane, then I can generate the twin. So the sigma three that we did in the last lecture, yeah, the coincidence side lattice is actually a twin orientation between the two crystals. Yeah.
Okay, so let's assume that we've now used this equation to get this matrix here, which defines the orientation relation between the two grains of ferrite. I now want to um, find the axis and the angle of rotation relating to, to these two crystals of ferrite, because the, the two bases of the ferrite are exactly identical. You know, they're both cubic I. Yeah? So you can generate one crystal from the other by a rotation about an axis and a certain angle of rotation. Right? So how, given this matrix, can I find an axis angle pair? Well, you know, when I, when I do the rotation to generate one crystal from the other, the axis of rotation is unchanged, right? So if I multiply this matrix by the axis of rotation, we get the same answer. It doesn't change at all. Yeah? So here, yeah, if I take yjx and if, if u is my rotation axis, okay, um, then there will be no change at all in the indices of that axis. This is a, a mistake, by the way. Can you see the mistake? Yeah, that should be y. Okay. Yeah. Um, but because the indices are exactly the same for y, u, and x, u, it's not strictly a mistake. Yeah. Uh, you know, the axis of rotation 1, 1, 1 remains an axis of rotation 1, 1, 1 in the y basis and in the x basis. So it's not actually a mistake, but it might appear as a mistake at first sight, correct? So I've got this equation that yjx into xu is equal to xu. Nothing changes um, if u is a rotation axis. So if I take this onto this side, then I get yjx into xu minus x u, so that's the identity matrix. Yeah, identity matrix is just 1, 1, 1, and everything else is 0. Uh, I get this equation. And you know this is a, a 3 by 3 matrix, and this is a, a column vector. So I'm going to write that out in, in full. Okay. So when I, when, I, when I write that out in full, I get three equations where u1, u2, and u3 are the components of our rotation axis. Okay? And we've got three equations and three unknowns. And of course, u1 squared plus u2 squared plus u3 squared equals 1 because it's a unit vector. When you solve that, you get the rotation axis as 1, 1, 1. Okay? You know, this is a simple solution of simultaneous equations. If I take u3 onto this side, then I can eliminate u3 from the next equation and so on. Yeah? When I solve that, I get my rotation axis for this particular uh, twin orientation as 1, 1, 1. Okay? And it will be 1, 1, 1 in both crystals. Now, how do I find the rotation angle? So I've got this axis here, and if I look at the plane which is at 90 degrees and see what happens to a vector in that plane as a consequence of the rotation, then I've got the angle. Yeah? So it's very easy to derive the axis and the angle. But I want to point out something interesting. Uh, this this uh, is the most general representation of that rotation axis. So if, if we have an axis of rotation which is u1, u2, u3, and we do a right-handed rotation by theta, then this will be the components of that matrix. Okay. Now, at the moment, I can't show you how to derive this because we haven't done something called similarity transformations, which we will do in another lecture. Right? But trust me, this is... If you have an axis and an angle of rotation, then you can derive the rotation matrix very easily, where m is cos theta and n is sine theta. Right? Now, if you, if you look at this, then add these three elements together, okay? these three, so j11 plus j22 plus j33, then this is 1 plus cos two, uh, 2 cos theta, where theta is the angle of rotation. So if I give you a rotation matrix, you can easily find the rotation angle. Yeah. 
And similarly, if you want to find the rotation axis, then here are the equations which give you the rotation axis. Conversely, if I give you a rotation axis and angle, you can use this to derive the rotation matrix. Okay. So th this is a, a, a nice equation which, which is uh, very useful either to derive the axis angle pairs instead of going through the simultaneous equations and then uh, finding a vector which is at 90 degrees and working out a theta. You can use this simply to find the axis angle pair. Okay? The derivation of this we have to reserve until later. Okay? Okay, now here are two ferrite crystals uh, related to each other, Y and Z, and another two ferrite crystals, Y and X. And you can see that they are both, uh, the numbers in these matrices are the same. Okay, they're both the twin related crystals. Uh, they are simply arranged in different order. So I've got YJZ and YJX. And if I want to find ZJX, then I do an equation similar to this. Given these two, it's very easy to find this. Okay? And you get this as the relationship between Z and X. So these are three ferrite grains. And we've got the orientation between Y and Z and Y and X. And ZJX is simply equal to ZJY into yjx. Yeah. Now, does that look like an interesting matrix? Yeah. Notice everything is, is one in there. Yeah. And given that if I add all these up, I, I get 1 plus 2 cos theta. What do you think is the value of theta? Hmm? 90 degrees, because 1 equals 1 plus 2 cos theta, right? Okay, so 2 cos theta is 0, and therefore theta is 90 degrees. And just, just using your imagination, what do you think is a rotation axis? Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So it's the 0, 0, 1 axis. Uh, if I multiply this by 0, 0, 1, you'll see it remains as 0, 0, 1. So what is an operation of 90 degrees about 0, 0, 1? Hmm? What happens if I do a rotation of 90 degrees about 0, 0, 1 in ferrite? Yeah, so go on. Be brave. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, it's an axis of fourfold symmetry. So if I rotate by 90 degrees, I don't get any change. So what does that say about the crystal Z and X? They are exactly the same orientation in space. Okay? Yep. So those two crystals are not actually different. Okay, 90 degrees about O one x Now, here's a, a diffraction pattern between uh, Y and X, all right? I want you to ignore these spots here, which come from something known as double diffraction, okay? The, the two crystals are represented by this continuous line and by this dashed line. Okay, so they're exactly the same zone. It's a 1, 1, 0 zone axis from the two crystals. And what I want you to do is by looking at this diffraction pattern, okay, can you identify a rotation axis which will generate one from the other? Tell me what it is. Yeah? Which rotation axis and what angle will generate one pattern from the other? 
here. I, I haven't indexed this, but uh, you mean the vertical axis here? Yeah? And what's the angle of rotation about this axis? Hundred eighty degrees, yeah. So we have a vertical axis. If I rotate by hundred eighty degrees, then I will get the other pattern. Now, is that unique? Is there any other axis angle pair which will generate exactly the same pattern? Yeah. Which one did you say? Out of out of, out of here or horizontal? Horizontal, yep. So again, you see, if I, if I rotate by 180 degrees about this axis, I will generate exactly the same pattern. Any other? Yeah, yeah, I mean, if I, if I rotate by 70.52 degrees about this axis, I will also get the same result, <laughs> okay? So, so we've got three different axis angle pairs which are giving us exactly the same diffraction pattern. So which is the correct axis angle pair? You know, they're all correct. Yeah. The problem is that we've got a lot of symmetry in cubic crystals, and you can find 24 different axis angle pairs to represent the same orientation relationship. OK? 24 with cubic. And when you look at your EBSD data, right, it gives you an axis angle pair. But what it does, it calculates all 24 axis angle pairs and gives you the one which is the smallest angle of rotation. All right? But that's an arbitrary choice. It's a convention which is employed, yeah, that it gives you the axis angle pair with the smallest angle of rotation. But there are 24 equivalent axis angle pairs for any orientation in the cubic system. Okay? Is that, is that clear to everybody? And they're all symmetry related. So, in general, the number of axis angle pairs that you get will depend on how many dyads you have, how many triads, how many tetrads, and how many hexads you have in your system. Okay. So obviously, as, as you deal with less and less symmetric crystals, the axis angle pair becomes more and more unique. Okay? Okay, so I'm going to now uh, change the, the subject. We've dealt completely with orientation relationships. And we now want to deform things, okay? And we want to deform them homogeneously. That means that every vector will undergo the same strain, okay? And we're not going to say, uh, take a vector and put a step in it. The vector will be stretched and rotated but it will not have any kinks produced in it. That's the meaning of a homogeneous deformation, right? So if you have a shear band going through your material, that's not homogeneous because the vector will get a step in it, right? Homogeneous means everything is stretched and rotated, but not kinked. Everybody happy with that? Right, so this is a, a beautiful example uh, in 1924, you know, Bain came up with the mechanism by which you could change austenite into ferrite by a homogeneous deformation, right? So here are two, two unit cells of austenite drawn next to each other. So th this is face centering here, and these are at the corners. So you can see these are two unit cells of austenite drawn next to each other. I can draw inside the austenite without doing anything, so we're still keeping the atoms at exactly the same positions, a body-centered tetragonal cell of austenite, right? You can see this is body-centered and it's tetragonal. If I now deform this by compressing along this axis and expanding along these two axes, then I get the body-centered cubic cell of ferrite. So without any diffusion, you can change the austenite into ferrite by compressing along there and expanding along the two axes. And that's called the Bain strain. Okay? And we'll come to this uh, later when we deal with martensite. 
or, or many other displacive transformations. But the main strain consists of a uniform expansion in this plane. Okay, so this is expanded and this is expanded, and the amount of expansion is given by the ratio of this uh, ferrite lattice parameter to the half 110 of the austenite. So here you are. Okay, that's the expansion, and this is a contraction because you know that the lattice parameter of ferrite, which is 2.867 angstroms, okay, and this is 3.567 angstroms. So this is a contraction. Now, this is not a strain. It's, it's what we call a, a deformation. So it's the ratio of the final to the initial length. A strain is a difference, right? You know, it's the change in length divided by the total length, whereas this is a, a distortion. So we are saying the final length divided by the original length, right? And notice also that in this case, when I compress along this axis, that axis is not rotated, it's simply compressed. And the same applies to these two axes, that it's simply compressed, it's not rotated. So in a deformation, when an axis is not rotated but is simply stretched or, or compressed, uh, we have a special term for that axis. Do you know what that is? It's a principal axis of the deformation. All right. So, so if you have a, a pure deformation, then for that deformation, you're always able to find three axes which are unrotated. They may be stretched or compressed, but they are unrotated. So in this case, these are the principal axes of the deformation. And I can represent this strain using a matrix. I want to show you that there's a difference between what we are doing now and the coordinate transformations. So in the coordinate transformation, we are not changing the vector. The vector is the same whether you refer to it in the A basis or the B basis, right? So here's the vector. It simply acquires different components depending on whether we refer it to A or refer it to B. But the vector is unchanged by the coordinate transformation, right? A deformation is different. We are not changing the basis, okay? What we are doing is we are stretching the vector and rotating it. So if u is our initial vector, it becomes a new vector v. So in the same basis, it will acquire different components. Are you, are you clear about the difference between a deformation and a change in the coordinates? Yeah? Now, given that we are not changing the coordinates, my matrix, will have the same basis symbol on both sides. Okay? Whereas here we have a different basis symbol. So to distinguish a deformation from a coordinate transformation, we have the same basis symbol. Okay? No, uh, the basis uh, you keep constant. It's a, it's a reference. Yeah? So the basis vectors uh, are outside of the deformation. OK, so, so for our Bain strain, uh, just like we did in our coordinate transformation matrix, if you look at what happens to the 1, 0, 0 axis, the 0, 1, 0, and the 0, 0, 1, then as a result of the Bain strain, this one will become eta 1, 0, 0, where eta 1 was the expansion in the horizontal plane. <clears throat> this one will become 0, eta 2, 0, which is actually the same as 0, eta 1, 0, because the expansion in the horizontal plane is uniform for the Bain strain. And this one becomes 0, 0, eta 3, uh, where eta 3 is less than 1, because we are compressing. Yeah? And this is before and this is after. So I can easily express this in a matrix. This is my deformation matrix. If I multiply it by zero, zero, uh, by one, zero, zero, I will get this. If I multiply it by zero, one, zero, I will get this. And if I multiply it by zero, zero, one, I will get this. So this is our deformation matrix, okay? Describing the Bain strain. And now if I want to calculate what happens to the one, three, five vector, then I simply take that deformation matrix, multiply it by one, three, five, and I'll see how it is changed. 
And I can work out not only how it is stretched, but how it's rotated. These are not rotated because these are the principal axes of the deformation, but any other vector will be rotated as well as stretched. Yeah. So the amount of rotation you can find out by simply taking the dot product before and after of u and v. Everyone happy with that? So this is called a pure deformation because we, uh, we've got three principal axes along which there is no rotation. Okay. So all we are doing is compressing and stretching. And I, I can illustrate this deformation in a slightly different way. If I, if I draw my austenite as a sphere, what do you think will happen to the sphere as a consequence of the Bain strain? Ellipsoid. It will become an ellipsoid. It will be squashed. Yeah. Uh, like, um, what's that uh, chocolate coated? I forget what it's called. It's called treats or something, is it? In, in the shop here, I buy sort of peanuts with chocolate coating on. So it, it's like a squashed sphere. Okay. Anyway, next time I will bring this packet along. Okay, so um, first of all, this is a pure strain, and you saw that the matrix is symmetrical because that deformation is referred to the principal axis. Principal axes are unrotated, and the volume change due to this deformation will be the determinant of that matrix. So here now is that representation of that deformation in terms of a sphere. So this is my austenite. In the horizontal plane, I've got uniform expansion. Yeah? So this circle becomes a bigger circle. But along the z-axis, the circle becomes squashed. So I have an ellipse here. Yeah? Is that clear? This is the z-axis and this is the x-axis. Here we have expansion. So this